Welcome to chapter 7 of the book by Dr. Larry Van Hook called, The Fourth Wall. I this chapter our main character learns that just a little deception can go a long way. He doesn't interview a demon this time, just sees a glimpse of their schemes in undermining God's grand story. We hope you enjoy this short chapter and our main character journeys between the seen and unseen worlds. We encourage you to share this podcast with those who would enjoy the philosophical theme as well as those who just enjoy imaginative stories. Please subscribe and like. God bless. Chapter 7 Drive by Demons Next, she took me to a church in Houston, Texas. The crowd was coming in and finding seats. A rotating globe was on the stage in the vast auditorium's front center. I wondered if she would go to the stage again and pull out a demon from the pastor. She said no. Here, she said, was an example of drive-by demons at work. This church had people praying, and some were deeply faithful to Christ. What's the problem then? I asked her as we sat down in seats at the higher levels. We wanted to avoid being sat on or sat through. Look, she said pointing down at the crowd. Little bat-winged, baby-looking imps were flying around, looking for someone to settle on. They didn't see us, for Ariel hid us from their sight. It was like a giant swarm of terrifying mosquitoes. Can we chain them? I inquired curiously. Yes, she said, but it would be like swatting flies. We have special warrior angels for that. For now, you just need to see them. Okay, I replied, feeling like a child at a museum again. She lowered her hand and said, Since these demons cannot get a secure foothold in the church because of the prayers of the faithful, they shoot in and out, doing as much deceptive destruction as possible. Eventually, the greater demons gain enough foothold to either destroy the church or ruin its fruit. They don't have to do much, she said. Imagine with me that you are traveling on foot somewhere. People tend to walk in circles in the woods because they favor one foot. If you are off course by one degree, you will be off about one hundred feet after one mile of walking. Again, imagine you were flying on a heading that takes you from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. You would miss your destination by over forty miles. In the same way, if you knew that an asteroid was in an orbit that would impact the Earth, just less than a single percent trajectory change would prevent it from hitting the Earth. These demons don't have to deceive you by much. Is this why you brought me here? To make this point? I asked, looking straight ahead, still captivated by the buzzing of the demons below. Yes, she replied. This is an infection into the church by the council of demons who call themselves simply Abraham. Of course, they have nothing to do with the real Abraham, but they hope to recreate the story of all the major religions to prepare for Beelzebub's offspring. Let me explain some of their evil schemes. You understand now that the Word of God created your universe. The universe arises from his imagination and his alone. He instructed its existence, and he wrote the story. The demons try to pervert God's imagination by telling you humans that you can control this imagination using the magic of your words. Some of you humans call it the Law of Attraction. I told Ariel I had heard of this law because some people told me about a book called The Secret. She nodded in agreement. She continued, God's imagination is simply information or instructions. This wasn't mystical in the human sense. It is more like science. God and Jesus Christ created the world as the spirit hovered over the canvas. All three in one created the grand story. You cannot tap into God's imagination for your ends. However, the demons try to pervert the story, to mar it. What the Council has tried to do is clever. They tell you, humans, that God's creative power is subject to your will through your words because you are part of some cosmic background radiation. Once you get tuned to this cosmic frequency, you can manifest your reality or, wait for it, your own story. You see a trend here with these devils? Absolutely, I replied, as I saw the pastor begin his sermon. She went on with her teaching. This pastor is one example of the council's success at slipping false heresies into the churches. Instead of the a law of attraction, they call it the word of faith. 
It was a small heading change about a hundred or so years ago, and now they are way off course. Unfortunately, it allows many of these devils a foothold. Understand that these pastors see faith as magic rather than just relying on God's promises. What you declare manifests in the universe. It is a counterfeit imagination. These false teachers don't understand that on the canvas, only God's imagination creates reality. Only he is the grand artist. As if on cue, the pastor said to the crowd, Change the way you speak about yourself, and you can change your life. Anyone can create by faith in words, the dreams he wishes. But what about heaven, where we came from? I asked, returning my attention to Ariel. That is heaven, and we share an imagination until the end of days. Everyone's imagination forms a metaphor for the real, not the real itself. Only the Lord makes reality. Even when you lived in the world, you often lived according to your vain imagination. Besides, you would have no comprehension of any world outside the one you were created in. It forms the basis for your understanding. You cannot read any other story because you only read in one language. It would be best to have images, metaphors, and sensations to understand transcendence. However, you will be changed that day, and His glory will be revealed. God's glory came to you in Jesus, and you beheld that glory. When the end comes, you will see Him in the glory He had before the world began. The Council of Abraham distorts the grand story so that you become the God of your own story. They tell you that you are God's glory, and God has given you authority over His imagination. You can speak things into existence. She paused for a moment. I listened to the pastor speak. I think if a criminal were here, he would go away feeling better about himself, I whispered. Yes, she whispered, and he or she would go away unrepentant, for there is no message of repentance here like Jesus preached to you. How did this begin? I asked. Ariel sat back and took a deep breath. It started with a drive-by demon who introduced the law of attraction, though not by that name, to E.W. Kenyon, who lived from 1867 to 1948. The demon used the spiritualism of the time to inject Kenyon with a different heading. Though it was only one man, this change in trajectory eventually resulted in us sitting in one of the largest churches in America. He told people to declare their healing, and they would be healed. His teachings developed further into the idea that health and wealth were part of the gospel, perks, you might say, to being a Christian. One of his followers, Kenneth Hagen, 1917 to 2003, kept the same trajectory. He increased the errors of his teacher by identifying Christians as incarnations of God, denying that the death on the cross was sufficient payment for your sins, in addition to the law of attraction theology. Hagen's influence is what led us to today, people being led astray from humility and reverence for the holiness of the grand artist. They have marred the grand story to make you little gods, I sat there stunned. What else was introduced into the church by demons? Ariel began another lecture. This will be a struggle until the Lord returns. The Lord knows that they are but dust. He knows that nations tell the story through the metaphor of culture. However, the church has forgotten its root. They have been engrafted into the tree. They have forgotten that salvation is of the Jews. The Gentiles have a seat at the table by God's grace. But the church has become corrupt, filled with idolatry, greed, and sexual immorality. They were adopted into the family as ones, not under the law, and so excuse themselves for abandoning what it teaches. For the first few centuries, they faithfully followed the word. But over time, the princes and powers of the air could shift their heading ever so slightly. Most of the church is Gentile now, having hated their beginnings in Jerusalem and Judea. They have replaced the pure worship of God with idols of bread and wine, their ancestors and angels. They bow and light incense to many kinds of graven images and pray to other gods of their invention without knowing it. The rest serve the gods of mammon and sex. They are full of immorality, heresies, and false teaching. They make their gathering shows for entertainment and all kinds of irreverence. They have made their Lord out to be their servant, loving the world and the things of the world. They have wandered far from the poor Jewish teacher whom they claim. However, as Paul put it, the age of the Gentiles is ending soon. The 
critic is not unaware. The evil horde is already trying to distort and pervert his Jewish remnant away from the tradition of Christ, rejecting Paul and imposing the law onto the Gentiles when God gave it only to his chosen people. History is complicated, but not so for God. Nations will rise against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms, but God's story will never end. He is in full command of his story. Your generation is a generation of confusion, even as knowledge has increased. If you are willing to accept it, the great falling away spoken of in Scripture has already occurred. Yet the battle continues to honor God's story. Come, let me show you, she said as she rose from the seat.